Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Hey, this is Dean. Uh, Dean Esme, just being Dean Esme, I'm not affiliated with any groups anymore, although, well, not officially, although I'm still a member of a national coalition for men, still hang out with the, my buzz at anti misandry at uh, Voice for Men and a few other places. I had swore to myself I was not going to get involved in any more uh, legal cases just because they're such a terribly draining thing if you've ever worked one they're 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 incredibly difficult they're emotional they're frustrating they're they're an endless struggle i decided to make in a case uh, an exception in the case of Corey here with the help of some of my friends and colleagues this is going to be the first of at least four four uh uh hangouts we're going to do where we're going to talk about the family court system and the train wreck of civil rights disasters that frequently c come from it, the way it destroys relationships between uh, parents and children, the way it even often help, hurts people, especially women, but hurts people that it's trying to help. We're going to be talking about all those things over the course of at least four hangouts. We're not going to get every detail out, but just to start, Corey here, also known as Mr. Dragonbeard, is running a crowdfunder, and the link for that is in the low bar. It's on GoFundMe. And we're going to try and keep this uh, conversation to about 20 minutes or less, if we can, so that we can get the basics. Um, what I will tell you is I have long experience in the family court system, and one of the reasons I got interested in Corey's case is not because his case is unusual, but because, in fact, his case is common. But I've seen him around for a long time. I know the kind of guy he is. He's interviewed me before, about a year ago, I think. He's talked to other people I know. He's got all his stuff in line. And he, and he, and he, he really is somebody I think we can work with. And the goal of all this is not just to help Corey, but to get other people to realize that there is a serious problem with the family court system desperately need in need of reform and desperately need of being cleaned up because there's an enormous amount of corruption in the system that people don't know about. Now, Corey here, he's from Ontario. And Corey, um, what I understand is that you are currently facing uh, possible criminal charges, uh, not for any kind of violence. You have no real violence record to speak of. Um, right. and, and not for being unwilling to pay because you've always been willing to pay. Um, yep. what's happening to you now? Tell us about it. Essentially what's happened is, uh, a very long family court system, very long. Uh, we're talking in, in the period of over three years now. Uh, we've gotten to the point where they've increasingly demanded uh, money that I can't pay. And um, we're just getting to the point where we might be able to very soon start the first trial date where we can actually start talking about custody and all this. Uh, but the problem you're referring to is that, of course, if I can't pay the amount that they've demanded, they've already sent me uh, various threats, uh, one of which is um, imprisonment for not being able to pay. Even though I've committed no crime, I'm a good father. Okay. You know. This actually, people don't know, but this happens commonly. A, a man will, uh, it can be a woman too, but let's get real. It's almost always men. There's the occasional woman. Um, although it doesn't even just affect man, men because there's many ex-wives and uh, mothers and sisters and daughters affected all by all this. Um, one of the common things that happens is the courts, people don't realize this, but the courts in most jurisdictions, this is the U.S. and Canada and quite a few other places, fund themselves by skimming part of the child support and alimony or spousal support money. They skim part of that money for themselves, and they will often, like in the U.S., get federal matching dollars. Um, so the system is biased towards squeezing as much money as possible out of non-custodial parents, usually fathers, no matter what. So while they give lip service to what they call best interest of the child, that's not what they do. They try to get more money. In fact, I know here in the state of Michigan, my own family courts typically run at a profit, and it's because of the way the system is geared. Um, yeah, I know it's rude, but what... How much do you make, Corey? Uh, I make about thirty-five thousand a year, and okay. doing um, what? they doing what? Uh, I'm a truck. I'm a truck driver. Right, working so class. If, guy. if I were over, 
Yes. So I, I make more than say, you know, I make more than minimum wage. It's a, uh, it's, so it's not considered skilled trade, but it really, it should be. So I, I make a good chunk higher than a lot of other people would. Um, but the 35,000 that I make, is not what they're going with. They're, they've taken the evidence of it. They know what my income is, but they've decided that I should pay at the income of fifty thousand dollars because okay. at one time, year, yeah, years let ago, me, I made more. So let me repeat that: you currently make thirty-five thousand dollars a year, but they're paying. They're calculating your support obligation based on the assumption that you make fifty thousand dollars. Even though Correct. you don't make fifty thousand yeah. dollars, that's actually from the difference between thirty-five. Right. That's a big difference, actually, um, it's huge. Especially, especially if you're a working guy. Um, and this means they take half or more of your paycheck? They take the maximum they can, which is half they take um, full, after deductions. So they take a tax. full half. You're, so you, you are forced to live on, hey, do this, do the math, uh, 16, 17 and a half thousand dollars a year. Um, let's call let's yeah. call it eighteen thousand to be generous. Let's say you work a couple of extra hours or something. Eighteen thousand yeah. dollars a year. That's well below the poverty line, and yep. and actually, you have to add, and this is a common occurrence. This is happening to Corey. It's happening to other guys too. Usually working class guys, um, but it can be other people. I've seen people who make a lot more still bled dry by this sort of thing. Um, they're also threatening to take your license, right? That's one of the threats, yeah. If they take that, then I can't do my job. That's right. So they might make you unable to do your job. Even if they don't, let's pretend you're a truck driver. You've got to somehow find rent, food, uh, transportation, clothes, yeah. and all those general expenses of life and still manage to find gas to get it into the tank so you can get to work in the morning. And we have a court system that is unapologetically making that nearly impossible for guys. Is this what's happening to you? Well, I, I also consider this payments being forced on extended family because uh, I require basically what you'd have to call charity from family members in order to keep even doing my job, keeping myself uh, from being basically homeless, like broken from, uh, um, you know, once you lose the job, the income goes down, the demands stay the same. It's just downward spiral. Uh, there are, in fact, a good number of, of homeless men who are homeless because of this sort of thing. Because no matter what you do, that 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 debt obligation never goes away. Um, out of curiosity, uh, tell me, how did you wind up getting together with your ex, and why did you wind up divorced? Uh, well, we dated for uh, probably about a year before um, she became pregnant. So we had our daughter and our daughter's now eight. So that tells you kind of a timeline, how long ago that was. And um, about a year after our daughter, we, we got married. So we were married for four years. So all together, um, the, well, we were not together for a year of the marriage. So we were together for four years, like a married couple. Mm, um, okay. During during that time, though, what happened was, and I don't know if anyone's listening has experienced this, the mental state, the uh, psychological state of my now ex-wife began to shift. She started having all kinds of problems, and it got to the point where, uh, you know, I just couldn't, I couldn't stay in the house safely. It was causing just as many problems to be there, if not more. And um, so, and then once that happened, once I left the house. Um, then that everything shifted over to her having the power. She got automatic uh, custody. Um, she hadn't been working because I had been working really hard to, to let her be a stay-at-home mom. So now, at this point, I'm expected to carry all expense <laughs> for everybody. Okay. So let me get this straight. You were working as an over-the-road trucker, right? Right. Over right. Trucker. This means you were probably gone a lot, too, because that's the nature of that job, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. When you come home... It's very difficult. You, when you came home, you felt your, your wife had emotional difficulties that needed addressing. Um, didn't you tell me that there's actually a, a court official has recommended that she be psychologically evaluated? Yes. Okay. Has yeah, that happened that's one, yet? The one thing that – no, has it happened? hasn't. The, 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 court, the court requested a social worker, independent social worker, do an investigation, and she came up with all kinds of red flags based on her investigation. 
um, mm -hmm. that she she recommended that my ex get evaluated and has not happened yet. But that's that's why it's so important that I am able to go go to trial is to present this information to a judge who will finally be empowered to do something. Psychologically evaluated yourself. Yeah, uh, from right from the beginning, I said I've actually been shocked that at least in Ontario, the court doesn't have any uh, psychologists on kind of on tap ready to help out. Mm. Uh, I was well, a little stunned by that. They certainly don't, at least not usually for men. There are groups that give such free counseling to women. Um, that's just the way the system is. Um, so you are fighting for, you, you've set your goal at about 25000 right? Um, Correct. What is, that yeah. to cover? what is that to cover? Well, that's to cover the fact that I'm, um, as my last billing period was from almost a year ago, so I'm about 10,000 behind just from the expenses over the last three years. Plus, mm -hmm. uh, it'll be about another four or 5,000 I'm estimating on top of that that they haven't even calculated yet. Because I, I don't know, if, you, if people haven't been in the system, they don't know how much lawyers have to, you know, they charge. If they sit down with you to talk, you're getting charged. If they sit down to write you a note, you're being charged. That's the way lawyers um, are, yes. That's the way then, lawyers are, yes. Um, and, and the uh, last 10,000, last... Sorry, Dean. The last ten thousand was just to estimate. It was an estimate uh, to cover an estimate based on what my lawyer said would probably be the cost of the actual trial. So I, I I've set it that high because I want to be able to cover my legal expenses and have this presented by someone who understands the language of the court. Which I I can tell you from being in court, it's saying to me sometimes what they're doing. I, like, I don't understand what they're doing. It's interesting if you spend much time in the courts, one of the things you'll you'll find is that everyday ordinary language that people would use to speak common sense to themselves is not interpreted the same way at all in court. And even things that you say that make perfect sense don't make any sense there. It's one of the reasons why having a lawyer is necessary. I'm not sure the system should be designed to make lawyers necessary just to speak legalese for you but that's the way the system is so you're not seeking just you're just hoping to get legal fees and you're hoping to get court fees that you owe uh do you think you'll be able to get them to stop trying to make you pay more money than you make has your lawyer said anything uh, about I think, that uh i well i think that there is a very good chance that if we have a judge who's able to get into all this stuff uh they'll be able to understand much more like they'll be empowered to get into it in a way that they will understand better. Uh, at the very least, I would think that they would be able to look at the situation and go, well, what good does it do this child to continually charge party one here, which we will say is me here, party one gets charged so much they can't pay it, might lose their job, their career, and go to prison. Whereas oh, yes. person two has been, has been separated for three and a half years and hasn't even bothered to get a job in any capacity. Um, up to this point, we really haven't had a judge that is empowered to really consider that in depth, especially in terms of looking at the uh, the evaluation report from the social worker. Uh, my my lawyer has been doing this a long time, and he thinks that we have actually a good chance because of how uh, you know the situation has unfolded, all the stuff we're talking about, that I might oh. actually be able to get custody, which is pretty rare. Folks, well, custody is another another subject. Um, is uh, yeah. You do see your daughter, is from what I've understood, right? I do. Yeah, I get her every other weekend. Okay, so you've at least got that going for you. You're trying to get more time, I yeah. take it. Maybe custody, but trying to get more time. But you're telling me, that I want people to hear this. This has been ongoing for a couple of years now. There's been a recommendation that your ex be psychologically evaluated on the table for a couple of years now. And because of the way the system yeah, works... Over two years. Of two years for more than two years now, even that has not occurred. Um, I have a right. personal theory, and maybe we'll need to talk about this in other hangouts because we've only got a few minutes left. But I have a personal theory that, um, you know, hey, I've known all kinds of people with mental problems. I've struggled with the depression myself, so it's not like I'm unsympathetic. Um, but what is that the courts can often manipulate people, um, uh, vulnerable women especially, um, so that if they have any insecurities, court officials like to, and lawyers like to amplify those insecurities to increase the fighting, to increase the, the, the importance of their jobs, 
uh, the whole system seems to be geared toward increasing as much, causing as much conflict as they can. Have you kind of seen that in action in some of the court's actions? Yeah, well, in particular, uh, the indifference of the court, uh, not, not there's, you know, at some point you think a judge would have some common sense to take some initiative. That's been extremely rare. But in particular, her lawyer has seemed to be the things that she'll say in court are just over the top. It's uh, I've actually sometimes just been shaking my head at the at the types of um, the, the the antics. I guess well, let's use the word antics. Mm -hmm. And the court is completely okay with this type of behavior, and it does nothing but drive us further apart from finding a solution. So are you saying that if you, um, that, that you you might even actually if your ex would just stop listening to all these people egging her on, uh, you might even be able to uh, not patch up the marriage per se, but stop the ridiculous fighting in court. Is that something you oh, think? I think might happen? Yeah, I think that's, that's a large. I think it's a large part of it because um, even if these people that are telling her these things, uh, giving the advice that they are giving her, they certainly aren't stopping to consider the fact that she might not be well and that they might not be getting the full story before they arm her to go to do battle. Right. Yeah. So by the time we get there now, we've got, we've got her thinking that there's no way she can lose. She's completely righteous. And then uh, let me sum it up this way. The last opportunity she had to send me an opportunity to settle she sent me something saying that I could have exactly what I have right now and no say in our daughter's life, <laughs> except for visitations. And that and, was her negotiation starting place. Uh, that's not responsible. And <laughs> it really isn't. It, it's no, not a responsible it's, attitude. In fact, I'll say it right now publicly. That's using the child as a bargaining chip. It's, it's a terrible thing to do to your child. Um, if she's listening, um, I'll tell you, uh, without without any hesitation as an alienated child myself that makes you hate your mother eventually and that's a real common outcome of, of for women who do this to their children sorry but it's true I'm not threatening I'm telling you a lot of people boys and girls alike they grow up with a mom who does this and they come to hate that mom uh, they might still hate dad if that's what she's teaching him to do um, the children suffer most from this sort of thing. I'm just on my soapbox now, but I'm going to say it. These cases are too common. Yeah. The system allows too many of them to happen. And your case is far from the most outrageous I've heard. I'm going to say it again as I did in the beginning. This Your case is actually typical. I hear from guys going through what you're going through all the time. You just happen to get lucky, and some of us decided, all right, let's show people what a typical bad case looks like that's being mishandled. I think your yeah. ex-wife probably needs better advice, uh, including better legal advice and better parenting advice, and um, even psychological advice, whether she's got specific issues or not. This kind of uh, controlling and hanky-panky behavior where you use the courts or where you go along with these court workers who are egging you on to a fight, egging you on telling you how righteous you are, egging you on to say all these things, wait a minute, are you, what is what you're doing actually making sense? Is it Does it make sense to charge a man more money than he makes? If he can't make as much money as he used to, is that a reason to punish him? Is there anything moral about punishing right. someone who can't make as much money as they used to because of their life circumstances? Is it moral to to let this happen. I mean, Corey, you're going to want, even if you get the amount you owe adjusted, you'll still owe arrearages that you can't pay because those accumulate over yeah. time. And making it impossible for your little girl's dad to make a living and feed himself and take care of himself makes it impossible for him to take care of your daughter. Um, she should hear this. The people in the courts should hear it. Um, everybody should hear it. It is unreasonable what is happening to this man and other men like him. If you want to give money to help him get through so that he doesn't go to jail and has a reasonable chance at being part of his daughter's life, see the GoFundMe link in the low bar of this video. Also, we are planning on Tuesday, the 5th of April at 3 p.m. Eastern, Paul Elam of A Voice for Men will be there to discuss with Corey the cycle elements psychological elements of a court of a case like this one it's something he knows a lot about um uh he'll be talking about the psychological elements then at on sunday the 10th at 6 p.m eastern time mike Aru of mike Aru media will be having a short hangout of about this duration to talk about what the legal recourses look like 
uh, for people in this situation. Uh, people don't know. There's some real civil rights issues here. Real ones, not the phony ones you hear from some of the more cockamamie, deranged activists. These are real civil rights issues, and people shouldn't scoff. This could be your brother. This could be your son. This could be your own dad. This could be your cousin. This could be your best friend at work. This could be you or you, your boyfriend or your, you know, um, your your dad. Any of This could happen to anybody. Mm -hmm. It doesn't just happen in Canada, which is where he is, um, in Ontario, but I've seen it in, in it, I've seen cases like his all over the United States, and I even hear from them occasionally in other countries, but nothing that's happening to Corey is unusual, would be unusual in the United States. Nothing. And that's something that's got to be changed. So with that, again, I'm going to order you to check out the GoFundMe. I'm going to remind you again, Tuesday the 5th, 3 p.m., Paul Elam will be here talking to Corey about this. Uh, Sunday the 10th, Micro Media will be at 6 p.m. Eastern. Uh, Friday the 15th, Hall Hannah Wallen will be. Um, she's worked a number of cases where she's from and can also attest most of what Corey's going through is common and people need to know about it. And she'll be talking about the need for systemic change. So with that, Corey, is there anything else? Probably don't need to add anything, but if there's anything else you want to get out, let me know right now. Is there anything else you want to say? Um, I just, uh, encourage, just encourage people to not uh, turn a blind eye to this stuff and take a look at it. it. It could affect someone you care about. It absolutely can. All right, Corey, take care. And uh, everybody, be, at Paul, be on Paul Elam's channel. Check out the GoFundMe. Have a good night.